FIB contains commissions, as you we probably know, some of which are very much academically orientated, others of which are very practically orientated. Um, I have to say Commission 5 is probably somewhere in the middle, but more towards the practical than the, than the academic side of things, um, as I'll try and uh, show to you. Um, I've put up here um, a lot of words about the terms of reference, which actually apply to quite a lot of uh, the commissions, but this is one of, being one of the more practical ones. Um, and it describes the sort of uh, the, the, the aims of FIB, where it brings together groups of experts to work, to work together um, and provide knowledge to people right across the industry for the, for the best use of concrete uh, and promoting new technology um, to improve the quality um, and including the whole of the, uh, the cycle of construction from design through production uh, of products where appropriate and testing, installation, and, and use of these systems. Um, and it's actually about getting people together uh, to talk about things and try and break down some of the silos that exist uh, in many parts of, uh, of, the, of the industry. Um, the areas of interest of um, uh, Commission 5 uh, are listed here uh, as reinforcing and pre-stressing steels, systems that use those, um, and includes non-metallic reinforcement, um, which is an increasingly a uh, interesting area, uh, and quality and protection systems, testing of materials, stay cable systems, ground anchor systems, and um, includes the actual installation of these, which is important to get right. Um, it includes all types of civil structures, in mainly bridges and buildings, but uh, other types of structures such as tanks and so on, as you'll see um, uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, and not just new structures, there's an increasing interest in uh, our existing concrete infrastructure uh, and buildings and, and, and the, the amount of work that's being done on it by most consultants and contractors these days is um, increasing um, every year to try and maintain our crumbling um, infrastructure and buildings, and a lot of which is becoming listed um, or preserved, and we have to find ways of, of, of satisfying um, the desire to keep those um, structures going. Um, but also new technology, um, which moves rapidly um, as the years go by, and stimula stimulating research, and then disseminating that knowledge for practical applications. Just a little bit of history of this commission because it's one that transferred from quite a long time ago, back in the days of the International Federation for Pre-Stressing, which was actually based in the UK in 1952 um, and supported by the old Cement and Concrete Association, which is a sort of former um, uh, old grandfather of the uh, current concrete centre. Um, and also by the Institution of Structure Engineers, actually, who, who had the secretary out of it before it merged with CEB in 1998. Um, and it, it was a purely a pre-stressing commission. Um, but then uh, on the formation of FIB in 98, it was, it was decided to introduce reinforcing steels into it as well. And it's always pioneered the development of guidelines for design and construction, you know, the original design methods for designing pre-stressed and reinforced concrete emanated from some of these early groups. Um, I just show here some of the international guidance that has been produced by FIB um, uh, going back to 98. Uh, I won't go back earlier than that, but some of this is still uh, of very uh, relevant to today's um, work, and some of it is being revised um, as time passes, technology moves on. M a lot of it is aimed at improving technology, um, where maybe there's a gap in the, in the knowledge or whether there's been a problem with durability or new things come on the market and there are no standards for them. Uh, so internationally, standards are quite important to have. For example, on grouting um, the, uh, and post-tensioning tendons, the use of plastic ducts came in in the 1990s and there was no international standard. And indeed, there still is no international standard. So FIB produced um, bulletin, se bulletin 7, I think it was, um, which has then been uh, superseded uh, a few years ago, um, uh, about two years ago, I think, by uh, this one uh, to take into account now current practice. And that is the worldwide reference document for polymer ducts uh, for post-tensioning. 
there is now a move to start working on a standard, but I'm not going to do it. <coughs> Time for someone else to do that um, and to make, create an ISO standard based upon um, this, uh, this document here. Um, so it, it is a, um, a, a, a pre-normative activity in, in a lot of areas where it produces guidance, like the model code, which, which informs the production of real standards in the future. Uh, the representation on Commission 5, um, as I said, it, it includes people from all around the, the, the corners of the, uh, of the concrete industry. Uh, there are about 30 members from 16 countries. There are currently, well, there were currently three UK reps. There's now two. Uh, myself, Ladin Kamchi of UK Cares, um, and uh, James Collins of Rambol, who effectively has, I, I managed to persuade him to carry on um, uh, and join it uh, because to gain the knowledge and experience and, and learn, which is something that you always do uh, if you get involved. It normally meets annually. It last met in Lausanne a couple of weeks ago, um, and before that, the year before, it was in Milan uh, for a two-day meeting. It has eight task groups. You'll see 5.7 is missing because it's been disbanded, um, because it's completed its work. Um, and 5.9 is the newest one, which was created uh, last year. And I'll just give you a brief roundup of, these, uh, of the work of these commissions, uh, of these task groups, rather. Um, and you'll see that they, they, they cover a wide range of aspects of uh, pre-stressing uh, and use of reinforcing steels. But the reinforcing steels, per se, are mainly concentrated in um, task group 5.2. The first one, fibre reinforced polymer, this has been going for some years and in fact is probably one of the biggest task groups in the whole of FIB. I think there are about 80 members, um, mainly because it's a, a rapidly developing field of great interest um, and it's very academic. Um, very large number of members from universities especially. Um, most Euro European universities are represented, represented on it um, uh, and all of those working in the field of advanced composite reinforcement for concrete structures uh, from all over the world it seem to have their fingers in it um, to, uh, to try and come up with uh, uh, agreed ways of, of using these materials. Um, the main objectives at present are, are to produce uh, design guidelines um, in accordance with the, the existing model code and Eurocode 2 um, and link with other uh, areas of, of development. Uh, of material testing and standard test methods um, where new, something new comes on the market. The first thing to do to get it approved is to have to introduce test methods and standards of some sort. And a lot of these people um, uh, participate internationally in advanced reinforcement, which stimulates its use around the world. Um, and obviously, guidance on practical use of these things is, is, is really necessary. And this task group has um, two working parties at the moment. Um, uh, internal FRP reinforcement and strengthening of FRP. Now, the latter um, is actually finalising a bulletin um, on uh, FRP used as externally applied reinforcement for strengthening. Um, and uh, that is actually being, com the draft has been completed and is in, in editorial at the moment. Uh, and that will form, inform additions to EC2 in due course. Um, so uh, it, it will be very relevant for practitioners to be able to understand how to use these materials for strengthening. Of course, the materials that, it, that are on the market are quite wide in the, their type, um, and FRP fibre materials really are, are, are a, number of, a large number of continuous uh, directionalised fibres bundled into a, a resin matrix, and depending on the type of fibre, they have different type of reference from carbon fibre, glass fibre, aramids, basalt fibre made from rocks like rock wool is your insulation material, and steel fibre. Basalt fibre is particularly one I'm interested in because it's a material that is naturally um, uh, occurring on Earth and there's a lot of it. Uh, it's, it's taking rock effectively uh, and creating fibres out of it. Uh, so it's quite an interesting field and it seems to be one, in my opinion, is perhaps the most sustainable. Um, of all of those uh, materials. The, uh, the bulletin that's been worked on and is now pretty much ready for production is actually a successor of bulletin 14, 
um, and it's about twice the number of pages and contains an awful lot more useful design information uh, than was in the, uh, the early one, which was produced, I think, probably around the year 2002, um, uh, which uh, was introduced when the material was first wanted to be used and, and, and people put forward the very first ideas of how to use it. But you can see that it covers sort of most of the topics that you would expect um, for the designer to be able to use um, this material um, in practice um, and includes de detailing as well um, because the detailing of the fixings of this material to an existing structure uh, is perhaps one of the most crucial things to get right. Um, and in parallel, I think as, Rob, uh, as Robert Vollum said, uh, it's quite common in, F in FIB to have task groups that are working both on their, the, the, the new um, FIB documents and at the same time on um, uh, SEND committees um, working on uh, improvements to the Euro code, which obviously come a lot later when the, when the new ideas have been tried and tested uh, and become robust and mature enough to be able to be put into a Euro code with confidence. It's a very important decision to when, when you cross that line to go into, um, uh, into the actual Euro code. So uh, this is the working party that a lot of the members of FIB Task Group 1 are actually also uh, involved in, um, in SEN. On to Task Group 5.2, Reinforcing Steels and Systems. Um, we've just had a new chair um, appointed two weeks ago um, uh, and a deputy chair, um, both of whom are from the UK. Um, uh, so we're very grateful for the support of those organisations in, in, in sponsoring their uh, work on that. There are about 20 members of this working uh, this task group, again from all the corners of industry um, and 16 countries. It had been inactive for a, f for a, for a few years due to uh, serious illness um, of the former convener, um, but now that we've got a new convener, it's reactivated. <coughs> you have to remember that all this work is voluntary. Very few people are, are, are doing it to, as part of their day job. Um, but it, it, it does help to uh, get them great knowledge for their day jobs. Their main objectives of this task group are, are, are in the longer term to review the reinforcing steel grades and I was made aware that we're now talking about grade 960 and, uh, um, uh, is, is, is on the horizon. Grade 700 is now being put into the American design codes and there's talk about putting it into the FIB model code. Um, uh, the, next, the next generation of that so increasingly these grades are being in increased um, and the new reinforcing materials and systems and bond properties Robert's mentioned uh, the thing about bond um, and whether it's 30, 40, 50, 60 or 102.7 diameters of the, the, that you have to produce getting ever more complicated we need to see simplicity and everyone knows this um, but this is more looking at the properties of the different steels and fatigue resistance, which is taking a lot more scrutiny these days. There isn't a publication being prepared at the moment, but the main focus of the group is actually looking at the update of the model code 2010 uh, to inform 2020. Um, and that's in three particular areas that are fairly new, um, uh, and that's couplers, uh, headed bars, um, and uh, importantly to inform the introduction of assessment into the model code one of the things we need to know information about is old reinforcing systems. Um, what was Hennybeek using? How did they work when you have an old um, 1905 concrete structure um, and you have to do an assessment of it? The systems were quite different in those days. Um, and trying to produce some sort of information on, on what's been used around Europe and the world <coughs> uh, since the invention of reinforced concrete in buildings, I think it was 1870 was the first reinforced concrete building. <coughs> uh, so there's a, there's a sort of um, initial focus for that group before they move on to their other stuff. Uh, task group 5.3, manual for pre-stressing materials and systems. This is a small group of experts who rather too long ago got together and decided to collect recommendations. Um, but uh, there's, there's an issue, as with a lot of things, where they're what I describe as chase technology in trying to produce a book, uh, something new comes up, so you, have to, you decide to put it in it, and then something new comes up, and you decide to put that in it as well. So uh, the, the, the uh, scope has been chopped right back. 
bearing in mind this uh, introduction of assessments into the model code to really just focus at the moment on systems, materials and historical information on pre-stressing systems um, and uh, how they were designed, how they, how they are ins were installed in, in structures um, so that when engineers come to do assessments they may get some guidance um, on what the system they find actually was. Um, task group 5.4 uh, recommendations for ground anchor systems. This is one where it was formed several years ago because there was a complete gap in international um, documents. Um, uh, the current chair, who's in fact just taken over recently, Hermann Weiher uh, from Germany, um, has promised to, uh, to, to revitalize it. It was chaired by two previous Japanese chairs, both of whom then changed jobs and, uh, and um, didn't continue with the work. Um, the plan is to prepare a bulletin recommendation for ground anchor systems um, using the, in fact, the only other international document around is um, dated, dates back to 1996, which is far too long ago. BS 8081, I think it's the British standard, but that's also of, of similar uh, vintage. Um, and uh, there's an awful lot that we've learned about corrosion protection and things like that, and also about um, qualification of systems, testing, and about maintenance. So all of these items are things that are going to go into this new recommendations document. Um, some uh, parts of the document are quite well finished now, and they're, 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 I believe that this will come out within a couple of years now. Um, but some of the things that you would expect to see in it, um, uh, based upon the, the sort of current way that we we produce um, guidance for systems is looking at acceptance criteria for materials for resistance um, and for durability and corrosion protection and qualification in other words approval uh, how you have to, to have a, a, an approval system uh, guidelines for manufacturing and installation and it will be based it's very similar to the uh, the two documents i've mentioned below which is the new polymer that systems, which includes all the necessary testing and factory control um, on the production of it, um, and a new one which I'll describe in a minute about stay cable systems, uh, which is based upon an existing document 30. Um, uh, some of the, some of the uh, techniques in that will have a, a theme which eventually will find its way into um, the codes. One of these is the, the, the idea of different protection levels or you could call them resistance classes or the opposite of resistance classes, which is finding its way into codes as well. But for ground anchors, um, it, it seems quite sensible to have some sort of age or expectation of service life um, and environmental conditions and therefore a different level of protection for protection level 0, 1, 2 and 3 um, for those ground anchor systems um, uh, to categorise uh, the very basic requirement of how long is it going to last and how can we make sure it lasts that long. Um, so whether it's a, for the very simplest one, a bare tendon with just some grout or um, with a, a polymer duct and cement grout or twin ducting or the final ultra, ultra one is with electrical isolation on the anchor head, um, which has uh, become a technique used on pre-stressing tendons now for, for, for the very best monitoring. Um, of uh, the possibility of, against corrosion. So that will be an interesting document. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a quite a keen group of people working on it um, at the moment from all countries of the world almost. So uh, task group 5.5, cables for cable supported bridges. Um, 28 people from 16 countries. It's working on a revision to bulletin 30, which is the Again, it is the world reference document for stay cables. Um, that was published in 2005, and it's really time that this was uh, updated. And the main uh, update is about extrados bridges, um, which were not really um, advanced enough to include in the previous document, but will be um, in the next one. And this says, for more than seven years, there's pressure from system designers to update the current document. Well, they have been working for seven years to try and produce this document. It's another question of chasing technology, um, and the, the 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 chair, who's the CEO of BBR, uh, is determined. He's organising five meetings the rest of this year to finish it. Uh, so good luck to him, um, but uh, he's uh, absolutely convinced he's going to get this um, finished. 
uh, for those that don't know what an extra dos bridge look like, looks like, it's a sort of a hybrid between a pre-stressed concrete box girder where the cables are inside it and a cable stay bridge where the cables are much more steeply inclined than here. The main difference being that you can put a great um, uh, deal uh, of additional tension into it at service loads, um, but there are fatigue aspects to be looked at. Um, similar contents list as you would expect for uh, something like this. Um, this is one of the main changes where for a stay cable application, 45% of the ultimate strength is the, is the upper stress limit. Um, there's a stress range of 200 allowed and a deviation angle, whereas for an extra dust application, 55% ultimate and a much lower stress range for reasons of fatigue. Um, you, won't, you may not be able to read all of this, but the, there are tests methods for uh, fatigue um, uh, recommended in the document, which would be very useful for saddles, uh, and saddle design um, and system design uh, of the various uh, components of these systems. Um, so uh, these are just a couple of extracts from the document. And some of the miscellaneous other things being looked at, bending stresses and uh, uh, epoxy coated strands and uh, stainless steel and so on. And importantly, recommendations for inspection plans, because that is a really important uh, aspect uh, that's perhaps not got enough uh, coverage at the moment. The next focus they tell me, uh, or they told me two weeks ago, and I'm surprised that this isn't in the document they're producing now, but will be some guidance on fire, icing, illumination of cables. Well, not, it's not a structural thing, but I, I suppose it's been very common these days and um, a, a further look at damping, uh, which is an issue um, uh, in these cables. 5.6 is uh, about cryogenic conditions. So this is about LNG tanks, um, where uh, cables are at uh, extreme temperatures. Um, and again, the last document on this is 1988, um, uh, state-of-the-art report. So that's really extremely too old. Um, and there's a group um, going to try and produce a recommendation um, for similar, along the similar lines uh, of, of these other documents. Work has recently restarted on this. I'm not confident that it's necessarily going to move very fast. Um, task group 5.8, external tendons for bridges. External tendons have become much more popular in some places um, because of durability issues with some internal tendons. And um, in uh, the United States at the moment, they're, they're even moving towards uh, moving away from grouting and, and, and using soft fillers. So there's a big issue there. Um, but there are quite a lot of significant differences between internal tendons and external tendons. Um, and again, there isn't really any common international guidance. Um, we need an amendment to existing specifications or some new specifications. And this, uh, this group is preparing a technical report um, which was 95% completed about two years ago. Um, and then, unfortunately, the convener moved from Parsons Brinkerhoff USA to Florida Department of Transport, um, and it, the work stopped. <coughs> but we have got a, a new chairman who's, who's taken it up and, again, has promised to try and get it uh, completed by the end of this year. Um, uh, and uh, I've seen parts of it. It includes some case studies, uh, like, for example, Hammersmith flyover strengthening, where we, the external tendons were put in. Uh, so it should be a very interesting one. The final one is sulfates and sulfide limits in grout and concrete. This is something which kicked off from looking at international grouting standards a few years ago when um, we tried to get approval of a, a limit for sulfate and sulfide limits in the grouting standards and asked around the world for, for uh, evidence of the, of the uh, limits that were in it um, in the current standards at the time and nobody could produce it. Um, and so we plucked the figure out of, out of the, the air and the Japanese objected and we said why and they said because well, we use slag in our grouts um, which contains high levels of these products. So I uh, looked at various codes and came up with the, the, the amazing and research documents, the amazing conclusion that actually there was no scientific research basis for any of the percent of percentage limits in the current um, grout standards and this applies to pre-stressed concrete as well where the strands are pre-tensioned because we put slag cement around pre-tensioning strands and they are not apparently 
subjected to uh, such a stringent limit of, on sulphites which, that is in the grouting specification. There is no, no sense in that. So I've uh, started off this work working party last, uh, last, late last year. And um, uh, I've just nearly finished. Um, there's, it has been formed jointly, jointly with RILEM um, and should inform revisions to standards, to standards uh, and it's particularly important because there's a lot of pressure to use more sustainable cements um, in, in construction. Um, uh, we know about chlorides and, and sulphites. We know all of these do um, cause corrosion, do or can cause corrosion, but the international requirements are completely different. And uh, there's no, as far as I can see, evidence to, to say what is safe. This is the document uh, that I'm talking about, um, published in 2010, uh, 2012. Um, and uh, uh, it really needs an update. And in, in doing the research, I looked at what the U New United States nuclear uh, regulations are. This is dated uh, 2011, so it's of the same sort of vintage. Um, and... Uh, I found this quote where it says, we know that these things can cause corrosion. Um, some of them are in mixing water and can, can cause stress corrosion. We better make sure that the, these corrosion promoters are limited to the lowest practical levels to be safe and prudent, uh, which means effectively I think they decided to put a limit of almost zero. I then compared what was in the ISO with what's in the nuclear guide, um, and they were on a different basis. One was p well, uh, parts per million converted to limit by weight of water, but the ISO limits were by weight of cement. So to get them comparable, um, we multiplied them by the uh, water-cement ratio, the inverse of the water-cement ratio, and get these amazing conclusions that the ratio of the requirements in the US nuclear regulations are on the left, uh, and in the middle is the ISO, and the difference in them, you'll see it's up to 500 times smaller than the current limit in the ISO. Uh, and I think that they just put naught, but as far as I know, there are no test standards that you can measure to this accuracy. <laughs> I mean, th this is one of the reasons the Japanese insisted that we put 0.4%. We had 0.1, I think, in there, 0.01, rather. And they said, you can't measure it. And I looked at the test standard, and uh, the, the, the variability of the tests means you just cannot measure that. Um, so there's, it, it's, it's a nonsense, and we don't know who's right. Um, uh, so there's a bit of work needed to be done <laughs> to try and... Um, inform this, and as I say, this this applies also to slag cements in pre-stressed concrete, by uh, pre-tensioned concrete. So um, they've also had sulphates in soft grout, causing soft grout in the states, just recently, um, and it's undeniable that, that that this international research is 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 needed. It may this may be because of poor mix design, but if you get bleeding, bleed water brings a concentration of sulphites, uh, and you can end up with a, hundred times what you thought you had in the concrete. So Carmen Andrade at the Tohorohi Institute of Madrid uh, is going to lead this work. Finally, other topics of interest for Commission 5. Um, there's, uh, I mentioned about flexible fillers instead of cement grout. There's pressure from the states to look at that. I thought you might be interested in the ACI 318 building code. has now put a requirement that all unbonded single-strand tendons have to be fully encapsulated in buildings, um, which is a move even further uh, more uh, than we've got in the UK. Um, we're looking at 700 MPA rebar coming into the market. Um, uh, there's a, a very interesting project led by James Collins for Rambol, inspection and monitoring of post-tension bridges, just been started. Um, and very interesting looking at the shape memory al alloys where you can effectively make something reshape itself um, by just changing the temperature and things like that. Um, uh, very, very interesting. So in conclusion, those are the publications uh, expected, I would say, within the next 12 months, uh, at least four of them, um, uh, to look forward to. Um, and um, thank you for your attention.